talking to us about the uh, medical benefits of marijuana and some of its other attributes, as we all know. And Dr. Chang is an MD, PhD, and he works as a interventional radiologist. He's going to talk to us about the history of cannabis use and the uh, current implications for medical cannabis-based products, which we all know there's a lot of talk nowadays about uh, legalization of marijuana and about uh, the effects of marijuana-based products like oils and that sort of thing. So Dr. Chang is a member of this church and a good friend of many of us here, and he'll be speaking to us right now. Dr. Chang. Good afternoon, Al. How are you? Happy Sabbath for those who are Adventists and believe in the Sabbath. I would like to welcome you all to the talk. I hope that this will be informational and help you understand this topic that I believe is gaining popularity so fast that a lot of misconceptions are there, and there are facts, and there are hearsays. So I have a lot of slides. I'm going to go somewhat fast. If you have any question you want to write down or kind of keep a mental log, and at the end we'll answer all the questions as much as I could, I want to tell you that I am not a dispenser. Neither am I a physician who prescribed this uh, marijuana. You need to be licensed by the state for this, and I'm not. I don't have any financial interest in anything that's related to marijuana. It's just a topic that interests me because of the lots of interest going around. And I thought if I'm going to look into it, I might as well share it with some of my friends here at church. And this is how it all started, okay? So bear with me. If you have some question that I cannot answer, I will research that, and I'll get back to you if you give me your name and a way to contact you. But I will do my best to clear some of the fog in this topic, if you want to say it. Okay, so let's go by definition. The word cannabis and marijuana are not the same really but people use them interchangeably but technically they're not but in a lot of literature a lot of news report and also in this talk it will be used interchangeably so just for the purists I want to clarify that but <coughs> the word marijuana really is the byproduct or the, the use of the raw flower or the leaves of the cannabis tree or herb. And the, there are several psychoactive compounds that it has, and we'll go over it, but THC is one of them. Um, and this is definition that I got from the dictionary. You can read that. Okay, cannabis usually is referred to the tree or the family of uh, tree, or tree or herb. There's three types, and we're going to go over that in a little bit. So those are just definitions we want to clarify. The word medical marijuana really is the use of the raw product of the plant or its basic substitute or substrates. It doesn't have to do with the purified chemical that is, that is approved by FDA. Therefore, it is not approved by FDA. So because it is not approved by FDA, it is still considered illegal by Drug Enforcement Agency. And we'll go over that in a little bit. 
So they are approved marijuana-based chemical by FDA. There are three of them in the U.S., and I'll go over that later too. Okay, just to clarify all the terminology here. Okay, let's go. What is this herb or tree? It is just a really uh, broad, uh, skinny, broad leaves, how are you call it, serrated tree that is very recognizable out there. It's very common all over the world. And there are three subspecies. Um, as you can see, the two most common is sativa, which is available throughout the whole world and is used industry-wise for ropes and fibers and stuff for many, many, many decades. And now there are the indica, which is mainly from India, that has more of the uh, chemical in it that is psychoactive. And that has been introduced in the North America only in the last um, 50, 60 years. And that will go over it again in a little bit too. So there are two main types, the sativa and the indica. There is another one that is not as common and is smaller and that is mainly in the Europe uh, climate and I won't touch on that much. Um, they are grown nowadays indoor mainly and to control the way they want it to be uh, to produce. But you can see that the same plant in a different location will give you one thing and in a different location the cooler climate will give you more the fiber. In the hot climate like around here in the tropic, in the desert, it will give you the, more of the race, the, the chemical, the, the stuff that is that most people that want to use it for recreational purpose will, will want that. So depending on how you grow it, and now it's being controlled mainly indoor. But it can grow either way. It started uh, from what we know back in China, uh, where first they found that there is, they found some evidence that cannabis was raised at that point. But um, the first really recorded use for medicine also is in China back in uh, 2000 BC. And from there on, uh, cannabis has been used, like I mentioned, commercially mainly to produce ropes and you know, fibers, clothing, well, I'm not sure about clothing, but for sails, for boats and stuff like that, all through history for much, many, many centuries and decades. It then recently been, relatively recent, maybe 2,000 years or so, been used more for food ingestions and uh, other purposes. In the United States, um, let's see, okay, yeah, um, it started, I just want to put this in because I'm going to refer to the biblical um, statement later, but as you know, Quran is based on the first five books of the Bible and plus the, uh, Islam and Muslim has their own other um, scripture that they use, but like them, in the biblical, Bible never really mentioned marijuana, per se. So in the Islamic country, the Bible and Quran and a lot of these do mention, you know, wine and being drunk and stuff like that. So that first statement, the topic there, I think it's in interesting that because it wasn't literally mentioned, the principles are not apply, but they use it pretty widely at certain times. And then it spread from the hot desert where chemical, the plant makes a lot of these chemical all across to Europe. And back in the uh, 1800s is when it started to be available in Europe. Uh, but the plant itself has been available but not used widely for its psychoactive um, purpose. In America, uh, first, as you can tell, the Spaniards, the one that introduced us to this uh, in 1545. Then the British colony got them in 1611. And mainly we think is for making ropes, again, for commercial and not so much for the uh, chemical use of it. It does uh, replace a lot of, uh, uh, 
a lot of the agricultural and back in the time of the early uh, forefathers, we, we know that George Washington have quite a lot of interest on what we call hemp, which is a family uh, or, or is, is cannabis uh, sativa. Anyway, in the U.S., um, we, back in the 1800s and 1900s, used a lot of this chemical for medicinal use. It was legal at that time, and a lot of it is actually being put in the U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical uh, pharmacia, pharmacopoeia, <laughs> that they were using it. But then um, it become more used for recreational use. At the time, um, marijuana didn't become more of a social threat. A lot of the immigrants from south of the border, particularly the Mexican, they bring some of their product, they use a lot of that, and part of the, the historian think was blamed for trying to control the use of marijuana in the 1930s. At that time, Congress went ahead and passed a 1937 Mar Marijuana Act, which did not directly either cost or did not say that marijuana is illegal. What they did is they taxed people who are going to use it, plant it, or transport it. But by taxing, it makes it so hard for them to comply. And if you don't comply, then it becomes illegal. So back in 1937, it was very difficult, and marijuana use became pretty much illegal in the U.S. at that point. At the same time, well, at around the same time, um, they were people trying to use some of these before, and they were blaming them for a lot of these uh, violent stuff. That has not shown out to be true, so it has been replaced. The, the theory of the marijuana is bad drugs, now is believed and also somewhat proven to be a what they call uh, the first line medication use and there are data that suggest that and well I think I have part of that to show but anyway it's a gateway medication to for more harder drugs if you want to call it is what we are uh, believe anyway the as the time from 1935 to 1950 and 60s, the penalty for using, transporting, or selling marijuana becomes, the penalty becomes worse and worse uh, with each state um, buying into it. And you can see the tie from legal use to illegal use, and now the tie is turning again. It's like everything else, you have a wave of approval and disapproval. In 1969, the Supreme Court came down and said, hey, you, that law that you passed in 1937 is actually unconstitutional. You can't tax someone for illegal stuff. So that was thrown out. Congress, at that point, the next year later, came out with another bill that can stand the Constitution. And now it was the Sub Control Substance Act of 1970. And that act, form what we know today as DEA, or Drug Enforcement Agency, which control everything that has to do with drugs and illegal use of it, or legal use of it. A physician who wants to prescribe any medication have to have a DEA license, and I have one. So they do control every drug in this country. Okay. <clears throat> Marijuana is classified as Schedule one, what's that? Schedule one is the most, the, the drug that doesn't have any, really have no medical benefit is what they say. But it has a lot of potential harm, a little, lot of potential uh, dependency. And you can see, I don't know, it's a little small, you can read, but some of the drug that it's classified with is like LSD, heroin, which none of us will touch. Marijuana is part of that according to DEA, and it is still
classify a Schedule I controlled substance. And because of that, research on marijuana is being suppressed by that classification because a researcher cannot just go out and buy one. They have to get DA approval, they have to get approval, it has to come from a lockdown uh, grown facility in University of Alabama or Mississippi, one of the two, and it has to be transported in an armor car type of a deal, making sure nobody will break into it and steal it and stuff like that. So it makes it very, very difficult to do any research on marijuana and its substrates. So because of that, is, there's not a lot of data out there to show if it's good, if it's bad, what, is, what does it do, and, but they are enough to, for us to know. And I'm going to show you what we know as of now. Like I said, the tide is turning from illegal use now to people want to use it. It started in, like almost anything else, West Coast, California, right? There, anything happens in California happens throughout the whole country. They first legalized for med medicinal use and for compassionate use in 1996. Well, with that wave, guess what? As of this month, we have 31 states in the United States that have medical marijuana or some, force, some type of law allowing people to use for medicinal purpose. Even though what I said was it's still illegal at the federal level, 31 states has legalized it. But nine states have made it just like you go out and buy a pack of six, six pack of beer or a pack of cigarette because it is used for recreational use now. Six, nine of those states have approved it. And you can see that mainly in the West Coast, all the darker green and in the liberal North East and the West are the, where it's been approved. And as of October 17, that green part, if we extend it up north, the whole Canada will be legalized. You can use marijuana for recreation in Canada starting October 17. So, and you probably have heard of that. Because of that, the media have really caught on to this. And it's gone like wildfire. You may have heard this week alone, there's a stock of a Canadian marijuana manufacturer or planter, or grow. That started at $20 or so per share. It went up to $200 in one week. It jumped from 200 down to 100, down to 200. It jumps all over the whole week. People were losing money, making money like, you know, it's, it's a gamble, it's a speculation, but it's just frenzy right now. Right now, the media is just taking this over and running with it. So, Anyway, those are the states now as of this, as of today, that are legal to use. And, you, and I do, I'm not a constitutional um, expert, but how many, is it two-thirds of the United States have to ratify to change the Constitution? Is that correct? I think we're getting close to that. At what some point, I think it might be a constitutional uh, fight in the future you know, to legalize marijuana. There's a lot of money in it. Okay. Uh, what is this? Facts, yes. We know that the marijuana is the most commonly trafficked, trafficked, cultivated, and used, abused illegal drug in the whole world. That number is conservative, 147. There's a number that say it might be up to 250 million people use this marijuana on a monthly basis throughout the whole world. So that number is very conservative. You can see in the U.S. alone, that's 2014. There's actually a newer uh, statistic in 2016, but the trend is there. 22 million people 12 years and older admit in the U.S. that have used marijuana within the last month jumped from 11 million in 2001. 
So the trend is people want to use this. This is something that people really want it. And <coughs> when, you, when a survey goes out and asks, well, do you believe that it should be legalized? You can see the number. Most of the Americans say it should be legal. And 81% think it should be legal at least for medicinal purpose. More than half of the USA it should be used legally without any restriction. So the tie is turning again, like I said. Now we're going toward the legalization. You can see that the number of emergency room visits has gone up too, with more usage. And that's not the only reason. Uh, I, maybe I don't have the slide, but the reason the emergency room visit, I might be ahead of myself, that might be a slide, is that the potency of marijuana has gone up a lot. It used to be around 3% of the active chemical, some of the currently used smoke or whatever medic uh, marijuana may be up to 20%. In the, so it has gone up almost tenfold. And that's why people who think they can smoke one cigarette or a joint, when they do that, they may get into trouble just by doing that because it's, there's no control on how much chemical can be in it. Okay, so what is in that broth of chemical that people use? There are over 480 uh, chemicals that they can see, and then when you burn it, the combustion product is over 2,000 of who knows what chemical that they're inhaling um, at that point. What we want to talk about is the uh, cannabinoids, which is the buzzword for chemically active compound that comes from marijuana. There's up to a hundred of those that has been uh, isolated so far. Okay, so what are these? You might see all these uh, alphabet words. A lot of them start with a C for cannabis, but you can see all of that. The one that most of you probably heard of is THC, right? How many of you have heard THC? I think majority of half. And how many of you have heard uh, CBD? Okay. Um, somebody just showed me Consumer Report does have a big article this month on October, on October edition that came out a, a week ago, uh, for next month, that came out a week ago on the use of CBD and marijuana. So. Now it's more people is going to be talking about it. Last, this week, NPR, which is National Public Radio, has a big feature on marijuana and use of it. So the media is just really catching on on that. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate mainly on THC and CBD, which account for more than 40% of the psychoactive um, product in the most of the uh, chemical preparation or form of marijuana. Okay, cannabinoids is that 100 or so chemical. You can break it down to psychoactive and not psychoactive. And the list is up there. What is psychoactive? Well, something that alters your mind. Psychoactive. So anyway, just, just for a kick. What is the most commonly used psychoactive chemical in this country or in the world, you think? What is it? Coffee? Coffee. Nicotine? Yeah, coffee wins by far. Caffeine. Not just coffee. Caffeine, you know, you see them in Coke. All soda, Mountain Dew, and ca coffee. And they make it even sexier with some French name, cappuccino, Italian name, and all the stuff. So, you know, but it's all the same thing. Caffeine is the main ingredients that people want. We're not talking about that. I, I like that because there, there, there's a lot of stories you can talk about it. But that's a different day, a different topic. Okay, the three one that you may hear about that is being researched the most or know about is T. HC and CBD. The third one there is CBN. Again, it's there because it has 
a direct fit into one of the receptor that we'll see later. But the two that um, you can see, CBD is the new, the new fat drugs or nutritional supplement, if you want to call it. And you're going to hear a lot of that. And the reason is because it does not have the psychoactive effect of THC, meaning you don't get high, you don't get a lot of these other sub, um, Ma hallucination and all this thing from taking it. And it may have the other stuff that is beneficial, which people like, like anti-inflammatory and some, you know, and some of these, um, one that a lot of people say neuroprotective, meaning it helps protective. But CPD also is known to actually counteract the effect of THC. So it's interesting that in the same product, you got two chemicals that kind of try to control each other. Um, so anyway, we'll talk about it in, also in a little bit. Um, okay, I mentioned that we are going to talk about the two. Before we can talk about that, we need to know why is THC really, or where does it work? Well, back in 1990s, scientists came out and discovered there are these natural occurring uh, chemicals in your body that the cannabinoids act on, and they, they name it anatomite. These chemicals um, react on two type of receptors. There are CB1 and CB2. And it, and that was found in 1990s. A lot of these, um, I'm try, I'm, I don't want to go really deeply into it, but CB1 um, and CB2 are receptors that these uh, cannabis product binds into and mimics its normal occurring chemical in your body. It is a presynaptic type of a circuit, meaning that it goes and control the release of the neurotransmitter before it fires. So it does have some kind, it controls the excretion of a lot of the neurochemicals. And you'll see why it's important in a little bit. So the reason, um, the, the three that we mentioned earlier, THC, you see that key, it is a complete fit with CB1. And then uh, CBN, which we're not gonna talk about much, is a complete fit into the receptor of CB2. CBD, on the other hand, does not work with this. And we really don't know where it works or how it works. But it is supposedly the wonder drugs of the 2018. Okay, CB1. What does the CB1 receptor do? It is mostly in the neuro neural system, in the main central nervous system, the brain, spinal cord, and in the peripheral nerve. And it does all these other um, things up there. You know, it gives you pleasure, it helps with the memory, it helps with the, your thought, your concentration, your sensory, your perception, your coordination, all of that. It modulates that. CB2, which THC does not have, have some effect, but CBD does not, is more in the periphery. It has a receptor in the immune system, a lot of it, but it also has some in the nervous system, but not as much. Well, what's the importance of that? Well, you can see what tissue contains CB1 and what tissue contains CB2. Pretty much almost every organ in your body has it. The brain, the nervous system has the most. Okay, so it does affect every, almost every part of your body, this chemical. Let's talk about THC, which is the most known and the most um, um, active chemical. This is the chemical that is uh, the one that causes all these cycles, uh, active product. It works just like receptors in the narcotic system. But the thing that I want to show on this slide is that, and in a little bit, brainstem. Anybody heard of brainstem? Most animal has brainstem, right? 
And brainstem controls your breathing, controls your regulatory, your you know, acid, your fluid, and everything. It is the basic function of your body. Well, for some reason, there's hardly any CB1 and CB2 receptor in the brain stem. Because of that, marijuana does not affect that, but narcotics receptors is abundant throughout the brain stem. So you can overdose on opioids, and people do die from it, from respiratory suppression. They can't breathe, they go, they, you know, you know, you, you heard all these people, all these famous singers die from drug overdose, whether it's legal or illegal. Well, that's based on the brainstem and over, um, over, over action and suppression that. Marijuana does not have that. And that's why it's considered safer drugs because you can't overdose and get killed by it. Okay, here is your brain. And part of it, this is looking at it in the medial slice of the middle part, and you can see that different part of the body has different function, or different part of the brain control different function in your body. And just kind of, this is just to show, and those dots are the receptor they saw from THC. You can see that a lot of it is in the frontal lobe, the so-called neo, uh, the, the prefrontal cortex, the part where your mind is controlling the whole thing. It helps with higher function of the brain. Most animal has very small frontal lobe. Human has the biggest frontal lobe. And that's where we think God or, you know, communicate with us. And that is where we control everything. It's the frontal lobe, and you can see that a lot of the, um, the receptors in that. This is where you put the two together. You can see the dots. You can see the where or what marijuana will affect. It will affect your movement. It will sensory for sure. The vision, not so much. Coordination, by all means, very big. That's down by the cerebellum down here. This is brainstem right here. Hardly anything. And that's where you know, people can overdose and get um, respiratory suppression. You don't see a lot. But this is where most of the problem is. In this judgment area where we control our mind. That's where problems can happen. Okay, these are kind of breakdown into what this area control. I don't know if you guys can read it. It's kind of small. But the main area is um, the neocortex. Your higher cognitive function is where uh, the function is. And then it has other things. It, con it has a lot to control with your reward system in your brain, your movement, and other things. Your judgment and your vision, not as much. Keep going. Well, this is just to show what the brain looks like. Okay. So... Um, this is just the list of what was shown in those pictures. Uh, cerebellum is the movement. This is the major effect that it has. Hippocampus, which is the learning and memory. The cerebral cortex, which is your higher function. Um, the reward system and the movement control are the areas that um, has a major effect by marijuana. If you have no someone with Parkinson's, basal ganglia is where that movement control is and they shakes. That's because there is um, problems with nerve in that area. Marijuana does cause some of these area to be inhibited. These are area that are not as affected. And you can read on that. And one of the one that I mentioned earlier is the brainstem. And the reason is, again, you can't overdose and get killed by it. Uh, but other things that affect it is right there. Your visceral, which is, you know, your, uh, you become nauseated or not. Your brain has a lot to do with that. And that is something that has to do with chemotherapy, which marijuana also helps. And it's been proven, which we'll go over it in a little bit. So 
What are the major side effects or effect, not really f side effect, major effect that marijuana does when you first ingest, smoke, inhale, whatever form that you use? And that's the list of it. It's almost everything <laughs> you can read. I mean, it does almost everything. You can go down the list. Um, you know, it does cause relaxation, which most people like, but it does cause other things. It does control some pain, it does reduce some blood pressure, it does reduce uh, some pressure between, behind the eyes, and those are important because some of the medication are being uh, used for glaucoma, which is the increased pressure in the eye. So these, it does. But how long does it work and stuff, we'll have to see in a little bit. It does reduce your um, sex hormones, excretion, testosterone. It does also show to cause uh, with a direct effect of a germ cell uh, cancer. So it does cause testicular cancer. It's known to be cause and effect on that. The short term keeps going. In the mental, um, it can cause at a higher concentration. You can have these uh, feeling of deja vu. A lot of people think they take it and they can remember things that they forgotten and they thought that's wonderful but we don't know if it's real or it's made up but you, you think you can remember things that you forgotten years before and it came back to you so that some people think is beneficial um, but it also causes other problems sometimes difficulty in concentration which is a problem if you were students or if you were doing something that needs concentration especially driving or operating machineries and stuff like that. And then at a very strong dose, it causes distortion of color, time, and sound. Very strong dose, visual hallucination. And um, it does cause a lot of personality change and mental uh, and your behavioral change. Okay. We kind of go over that, as you probably heard, you know. Yes, Pastor. Uh, is that uh, just regular marijuana? This is just a basic form of marijuana without the synthetic. This is the one that I alluded to earlier, as the concentration of THC increased from, in the 1960, one joint is only 3% THC. Nowadays, that one joint could be 20%, and people doesn't know that. It's like them smoking six joints at the same time. So because of that, a lot of these strong overdose have occur, and those are the sign of overdose, short-term effect overdose, and we have seen some, a lot of increase in emergency room visit as the concentration of THC goes up, it has done that. Okay, some of these uh, literature that has shown that marijuana and mental illness, what are the causation or is there any link? It has shown that marijuana, mainly in the adolescent, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit, developing brain, adolescent, has two to seven t time increase in development of mental illness if they were using marijuana in doing their child adolescent years. That has been shown to be a fact. Why is that? Well, myelin, which is the lipid content that covers the nerve, and it increased the nerve transmission multiple folds. So think of it as um, having like a generation two speed on your phone versus generation four, G2 and G4, how faster it is, or G5. Well, myelin, myelinated neuron fire at probably G6, whereas non-myelin fire at G1 speed. It's kind of analogous to the cell phone internet rate, okay? Well, myelin develops in your brain all throughout your years up to probably in your early 20s. This is a functional MRI of a brain looking at 
that white part in the middle where the arrow is is called corpus callosum, which is the white uh, nerve fiber that communicates between two sides of your brain. It cross, crisscross, and that's where the brain talk to each other. In people with schizophrenia and people with uh, a teenager that uses marijuana, they see similar reduction in that part of the brain. This is the difference between the people that use marijuana and people that do not use. You can see that right that white, the, the yellow part in the kind of the middle part of the corpus callosum, it's much thinner in marijuana use because of the myelin is not deposited there as fast. And that is one of the reasons they think maybe a structural problems with the long-term use of marijuana. Okay, does marijuana change your IQ? Well, kids, sorry, it does. There's a study in New Zealand where they followed 1,000 people. They took a survey when they were 13 years old. They look again, they talk to them at 18, they 21, 32, and when they're already grown up in 38, and test them and look at their IQ. What did they show? Um, people that start using around 13 years old, before they use, they almost have about the same amount of IQ when they start at 13 years old. Then they follow them up, several, you know, a decade later. People that use marijuana and people that don't use marijuana. People, the population that don't increase their IQ. The people that use them for three years or more have a significant reduction in their IQ. So that's proven. And that's in adolescent brain. Again, in the young developing mind. Does marijuana causes increased school dropout? There's another study that look at the kids that use in their 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade. There's six more times of school, high school dropout if you were a child that used it when you were in your 10th grade. Obviously, when you're closer to graduation and use it for the first time, your chances are you probably will graduate, so there's only one percent or one time drop. That makes sense. Okay, so here, we know that cannabis and youth, what does it do? It increases abs uh, absence and truancy, lower your IQ, it arrests or decreases your acad academic development and social development. Okay, oh, that's not a good, well, the, the, the blue part, as you can see, is the name of the author and the year that the study was done, all the way down. And these are, which that study showed there's reduction in IQ, reduction in attention with marijuana use, reduction in visual uh, search of objects with marijuana use. So you can see that there is incre decrease in good things and increase in, in positivity. People are more impulsive when they are on marijuana. Okay, let's show that right there reduction in a lot of the brain structurally, the thickness of the brain or the myelin or whatever, several study. Over here, this is more of the actual function. It increases the activity in your prefrontal cortex when they were doing memory things. You would think, well, that, that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, not really. It has to increase that function because the other part that usually do the work, it's being suppressed or decreased. So that's why you see a lot of increase in that area. And on the inhibitory side, it shows that people that use marijuana tends to miss error, where they will show different things where they say the stop-go type of uh, research, where if they see certain thing, it means that it's no good. And or, or a bunch of the same thing, which means everything is okay. They were able to recognize that everything is okay, fine, just like control people. But when there's something that is slightly different or slightly wrong, they will miss that. They will just have a lot less detection of error. So that's been proven scientifically. So 
for parents and grandparents, the adolescent year is up to 24 years, to 25 years of age when your brain is still working. What's, what is significant of that? Well, when the brain is still developing, they are very highly sensitive to environmental factors, suggestion, peer pressure, books they read, things they see, music they hear. Okay, so the brain mature from the back to the front, meaning the frontal cortex where the higher learning is has the last, is the last part where it mature. So in adolescent years, the area that is very mature is the basic function of the brain. A lot of it's pleasure center, and that's why kids, adolescent years are very uh, susceptible to addiction, to uh, pleasure, game, video game, stuff like that that gives you intense pleasure. Um, not until you get into your 20s is your frontal cortex more developed. Then you start to say, hey, maybe that's not so good after all. You actually have some, something in your mind that can control and say, there's maybe more than what you see, what you are excited about may not be the best for you type of deal. That prefrontal cortex mature later in life. And that's where people are having their uh, reasoning to see what, well, maybe what I'm doing is not good for myself, or maybe I'm doing this and I'm hurting myself. Okay, the key point again is what you learn stays with you for life. And it's, once it's in your brain, it's there in your database. It's hard to erase or change. So, parents, grandparents, you might want to tell your child or your grandchildren about their brain is not developed when they're in their teens. They're not fully developed till they're in their 20s, mid-20s. So don't make major decisions until you're in the mid-20s. Like maybe partners, you're, don't get married before you're 25 maybe. I'm not so popular with kids. Okay, so what are the major side effects, long-term side effects? Well, it's known that all those chemicals, if you inhale them, you can have respiratory irritants. It can cause exacerbation of bronchitis, COPD. Has it been shown to cause lung cancer? There is no data to show that smoking marijuana does cause lung cancer. Uh, as we know, lung cancer doesn't happen right away. It happens several years later. So I think still need to be seen. Uh, what else? Learning, environmental, maturation. We talk about that. Acute mental problems. We kind of touch on that. Okay. Tolerance. Yes, um, use of marijuana, you will build tolerance. What's that? What's the word tolerant means? You use one joint today, you're going to need one and a half in a week or two, maybe two joints. You need more to give you the same effect. You're getting tolerant to the medication. You need more of it to give the same effect. That is no, a known clinical symptom. Um, so what uh, we... A long-term effect. You will have decreased color discrimination. You have motor tracking problems. You can visual distortion. You can have uh, decreased recognition of things. Memory is not as good. Uh, peripheral vision have problems. So a lot of brain-associated problems. What else? We mentioned gateway theory. Marijuana leads to other substance use. So if you use marijuana, chances are they'll be using alcohol or even harder drugs. Okay. Withdrawal, yes. Dependency and withdrawal, people do get withdrawal if you stop using marijuana right away. It's not like nicotine where it is a lot shorter. It's not like alcohol where you may have your withdrawal symptom within a couple of days. It may not even show itself weeks later from after you stop using it. And the symptom is not as dramatic like 
a alcoholic going into what we call DT detox. They're very sick. They're sweating, they're doing all kinds of things, they're hallucinating, some of them are violent. Well, marijuana withdrawal may not have those, but it also can have all these other symptoms, just like uh, detox in alcohol or um, tobacco. It's still not a lot of things we know about it. That's the thing. That's a take-home message. We don't know a lot about these scientific experience has not been done a lot on the effect of marijuana. What we know is not real good. Well, does marijuana affect your driving? The answer is yes, it does. And it does dramatically. Um, if you think you can drink one drink and smoke a joint, and you'll be fine because you're I'm below here, I'm below there, under the legal limit. Well, if you are have low-dose marijuana and low-dose alcohol, let's say your blood alcohol level is 0 0.4, which is way under the legal limit, and you have one joint, your blood alcohol level will jump up to the legal limit just from one drink and one joint. So be aware of that. If you were driving and drinking and smoking. And it's even worse if you take higher dose. So. How long does it last? It lasts for hours. It lasts longer than alcohol. So you are compromised much longer. Okay. Let's see. I just said that a lot of state has zero tolerance on the level of marijuana in, you, in your bloodstream, meaning even if you have trace amount and you get an accident, you can be cited for uh, driving under the influence because of zero tolerance or zero limit. Okay, let's go to CBD, the wonder drugs or the wonder compound. What is it? Well, we saw earlier it does not have the psychoactive uh, property of THC, meaning it doesn't cause you to be high, it doesn't cause you hallucination as much, perhaps, or but does it cause other things? Well, we don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't know for sure. What do we know? Okay, this is the pharmacology that we know so far. THC, when you ingest, you inhale, you eat, or whatever, it goes into there, it has half-life of seven days. It stays in you for much, much longer. And um, it distributes throughout a lot of your whole body. CBD half-life is nine hours, much, much shorter lifespan. It is excreted in the different pathways, discreted, but broke, breaking down by the enzymes. Uh, I believe it's a uh, hepatic renal type of a, a hepatic type of a destruction or, or half-life uh, degradation. So it's a much shorter half-life, stay much shorter, you probably need to take it much more frequent to get the effect than THC. Okay. Like mentioned earlier, it does not work on CB1 or CB2 receptor, so it doesn't have a lot of those um, brain effect. What does it do? Or where does it work? What receptor does it work on? We really don't know. We really don't know. That's the take-home message, CBD. Even the Consumer Report, if you read that, they say, wonder drugs or something, painkiller, question mark, big, big question mark. And all the researcher in that article, we don't know. Don't have a lot of data. What do we know about CBD? One thing we know, it does have anti-seizure effect. It does reduce seizure activity if you have seizure disorder. How many here has seizure disorder? Probably less than 10% that will benefit from that, that we know for sure, right? No, seizure is actually convulsion. And, pardon? Epilepsy is another word. It's convulsion. You shake. Some of them are, you may not have shakes. You could be a, min, uh, a minor seizure, like absence seizure, which is kind of blanked out, but seizure of, of still. It only, um, because of that, 
FDA has approved CBD for seizures. It's one of the three medications that's approved by FDA, which is a chemical that's synthesized from marijuana, and we'll see that in a little bit. Well, it does have suggested in animal experiment to have some of these other things. And in some people have taken these CBD compound and say, my pain is better. It has antipsychotic. It makes you more, or it makes you less anxious, anxiolytics, better than Valium, which is probably not the best anyway, or Ativan, or any of these prescription medications. It is somewhat a downer, if you want to call it. It calms you down. It does shut down the brain activity somewhat. That's why I think it has that anti-seizure activity. It slows the activity of the brain down. How does it do it? We don't know. In some animal uh, model, it does inhibit growth of cancer cell in the in animal and also in a what we call in vitro setting, in the test tube setting. If you put some chemical and the tumor cell doesn't grow, then it has an anti-cancer property. A lot of chemical does that. A lot of chemical kills cells. So is it really going to turn out to be anti-cancer? I don't know. Does it have anti-inflammatory? Some people think that it is. And it, there are some studies that suggest that. And the one thing that a lot of people say that it does is, an, is antioxidant. Isn't that what we all want? Antioxidant, another good antioxidant for us. And also, um, in a little bit, we'll see another effect that it may have. Okay. It works through the endocabinoid uh, system that we think that CB1 and CB2 receptor is but it does not work on the CB1 and CB2 receptor. But what receptor, we don't know for sure. It does reduce some of the excretion of the, some of the neurotransmitter, which is, a, which, um, is giving you some of this calming effect, of some of these um, pain receptor, like in the what they think maybe some of the narcotic work in the same way as the narcotic. Question mark, you see all those? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know for sure, but there are scientific information that suggests that it does, okay? What they think is it doesn't work only on one receptor like THC, like CB1 or the other one that works on CB2. It works on multiple receptors, is what they're saying. Since we don't know which one it does, it works probably on a lot of this receptor. It's probably do all these things. It is probably very good. Again, we don't know. <laughs> Again, I'm going to emphasize we don't know much. Not much pharmacology on it. It does, and proven to have anti-seizure effect. That is known. And that's why it is approved by FDA. At higher dose, it does cause sedation and ataxia. What's a, ataxia mean? Ataxia means in coordination of movement. So you can, become, you can sway from it at a higher dose of CBD, at, like THC. So it does that at a higher dose. OK, this slide here mainly is to show you that the same plan or similar plan, marijuana have 98% THC, 2% of the other chemical. So that's the one that recreation you, people would like to use. On the bloater and hemp, which is used for rope and stuff, has 40 to 1 of CBD to THC. A lot of the CBD are being synthesized for hemp or hemp type of cannabis. Um, but it does also have THC. So depending on if you go out and buy, there's over a hundred product of CBD or a thousand, over a thousand according to Consumer Report. There's over a thousand preparation of CBD. Where did they get their CBD from? 
Did they get it from the higher THC or they get it from the low THC? Are you going to get THC with it or not? Who's controlling that? I don't know. Okay, this is to show that different type of formulation has different concentration of THC. And you can see some of these terms, you know, hashish and all this stuff. Some of them are up to 70% THC, very highly concentrated in the oil because it is the lipid soluble. Okay, now, emphasize, illegally, it is an illegal compound, marijuana, the flower, the leaves, the basic form that you just showed earlier, that you saw earlier, is still considered control schedule one substance, just like LSD, just like heroin, in the federal level. 31 states have legalized that for medicinal use. Florida is one of them. Some of you may have voted for that. I think three years or four years ago in the ballot measure. Okay, what are the indication? In Florida, you have to have this list of problems to be able to be prescribed medical marijuana. If you don't have only one of these, you can't legally. But the last two, especially the last one, See all those wordings? Chronic pain, secondary to something like this, something like that. Well, if you have chronic pain, they will make it so that you can have it. Arthritis. Arthritis is not one of that list. But yes, if you have arthritis, they can fudge there and say, yes, you have enough chronic pain. Yes, people do prescribe for that. But it's not one of the indication, really technically, but they will give it to you for chronic pain. What about price, Dr. Chen? The what? What, what, do you, what do you know about the price of this one that's been legalized, the epidiolex? I don't know. They, they, we'll get to that. I don't know the price, but... Okay, so now, does Florida let you smoke in the smoking form? No, that's illegal. You cannot go out, buy the plant, and smoke it. That's illegal. Okay, you can use it by eating in the food. You can have topical, the oil, the tincture. You can vaporize it, like in e-cigarette or any of those, I don't know what, you know, these things that they burn, you can, the chemical, and you can sniff it. Okay, does the insurance pay for it? No. Insurance do not pay for medical marijuana. Why? Because it's illegal at the federal level and they cannot pay for illegal drug federally, okay? But, like I mentioned, there are three FDA-approved chemical by, that is just like marijuana or came from marijuana, that if it is prescribed with the indication, the insurance will pay for it, and okay. So because it's expensive, you have to pay out of your pocket, to see the doctor, to get the license, to uh, being able to prescribe, take that license and prescription to another place, the dispensary, to buy it, everything, cash basis, okay? Some people say, well, can I grow my own? No, it's not. It's not legal, okay? These are the three medications that's FDA approved. The liquid form is only for two rare ep epilepsy or epileptic condition. David and Lennox Gastrolt syndrome, less than, like with any medication, you can use it off-label. When it's approved by FDA, you can use some of this medication off-label. So if you have epileptic problems, can you use this? Probably. Would the insurance pay for it? I don't know for sure if they will pay for it. But if you have one of those two syn syndromes, yes, they will pay for it. But if you don't, I don't know. And I'm sure it's very expensive. What are you going to? I've never heard of those two syndromes, Doctor. The, those are rare childhood epileptic syndrome. 
they're very rare. But when drugs company do this thing, they go for anything that they can get approved. Once they're approved, like I mentioned, doctor can prescribe it off-label for anything else. There are two THC base, oral medication that are used mainly for chemotherapy induced nausea. Chemotherapy works in the brain system causing nausea. These goes in that system and <coughs> reduce that. So it's work. In AIDS patients where they lose uh, weight, wasting syndrome from AIDS, it is approved for that purpose too. And has been shown from I think California and some of this state where AIDS patient who, and came, uh, chemotherapy patient who smoke marijuana, they do have less of the nausea and they do gain weight, they have less problems, and that's why the drug company went and got those approval. And now it is approved. Because it is approved, these three medication is no longer a class schedule one. I think one of it's Schedule 2, the other is Schedule 3. What does that mean? It means you can get it legally. It means that insurance will pay for it if it's in the right indication. In other countries, there's another approved medication, which is a spray. It is a combination of THC and CBD in the one-to-one -one ratio. So you have the same amount for both. And it is used mainly for MS patient, multiple sclerosis, where patients having spastic, they're, they're all tens up. It's shown to relax their muscle. If you have some of these um, neurological problems and you have spasticity, it's shown to help. Is it a THC or a CBD? We don't know, but this medication is approved for the, both of them in the same concentration. Is it going to be FDA approved? Probably, if eventually, but I don't know when, okay? So, there you go. Summary of what we know so far. So, I also wanted to touch a little bit on what did the Bible say. There are people that say, well, the Bible say you can use marijuana, right? Where is that? I look, and I look, and I look, and there is none. That's up there. Every herb bearing seed you can use for food, right? There's a lot of herb bearing seed that you don't want to use for food either. So that doesn't mean that Bible blessed it specifically. Sure, can you use it? Did Satan degrade it or change it? We know that there's organically engineered plants everywhere. There's cross-breeding with different things to make things more potent or less potent and whatever. Did Ellen White say anything about that? I did not go into her writing because I, I wasn't sure what type of audience and I don't want to, you know, introduce that. I just wasn't using a biblical. So, yes, seed-bearing plants or herbs you can use. But do you want to use some of these really toxic herbs out there? I don't think you will. You know, so I think that's a stretch. There is one place where, for the anointing oil of the priest, they use this sweet calamus, which in the Hebrew, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, but it sounds like cannabis because it's cannabosum or some bosom. So some people think that cannabosum, it sounds like cannabis, so it might be cannabis. And some people say that that is where people use, or the Bible say, it is cannabis. Looking at some of these writing, some, uh, some Jewish writing, first of all, if it is, they're not smoking it. If it is, they're not ingesting it. It's mainly used to anoint priests. Oil and anointing, that's it. Anointing king, that's it. Nothing else. So, even it is, it's not blessed for food, blessed for using recreationally, but again, it's a stretch. Okay? I noticed you've got myrrh on there, of course. That's one of the three things, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that uh, 
that the wise men gave to were Joseph and Mary, and that's what paid for that. And you look at the, the cost yes. of that. It's very expensive, and that's what they bring for kings, for anoint king. And, and when the wise men came to, to find a king, what would be born, they bought the most expensive, yeah. you know. I paid for that trip to Egypt. Yes. God has planned for those, for use in the future. Okay. So what does the Bible say about mind-altering medication? Not a lot. Just mainly drunkenness. Wine, alcohol, maybe. And that's the same with Quran. You know, talk about intoxicating drinks. And Muslim will not drink. Devout Muslim will not drink. But they will use marijuana because it's not written in the Quran. Do we use literal wording in the Bible or do we use concept? I think, you know, most of us will not go out and get drunk because we use the concept, right? Whether it be wine or whether it be other form of narcotics, heroin, LSD, we don't use that because it is mind-altering, it's drunkenness. Well, I think THC does cause the high. It does have psychoactive, it qualifies for drunkenness. So there are many places in the Bible that talks about drunkenness. And a few Bible texts there, you want to write it down. But I think, again, more drunkenness, intoxicating drink, but what is important is that last code, that, that, that's the last on this one. It say we want to be sober. Why do we want to be sober? Because we are fighting a war against the devil. He's like a roaring lion. He's right there ready to jump on you. If you let down your guard just a little bit, he's going to jump all over you. A little of THC may give you a little high, you feel good. You're, you will loosen that guard a little. And that might be all that's enough. Maybe for some people, maybe not. I don't know. Some people have higher tolerance. But right there, you want to be sober because the devil is out there looking for you. What else? The principle is that we are not us. We don't own our own body, do we? God has paid a price. He has died for us. He has purchased our body. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. Do you want to defy that with any chemical, with anything that will, you know, alter your mind? I think that's the principle that we should live by. You know, we are temple of God. We're temple of the Holy Spirit. We, are, we should be a living sacrifice. Those are the words that God has written in the Bible. And I think that's the principle we should live by. Um, yeah, like I say, submit yourself to God. Resist evil, and he will flee from you. Okay? Last. Um, the promise is that if you have problems with addiction already, it's not too late. God has said that there is no temptation that cannot be overcome by his help. The promise right there. So don't be discouraged. If you're already being tempted, already in the situation, there's a way to get out. The bottom line conclusion is this. I'll take a question after this. THC, I think, psychoactive. I have no problems putting it as Schedule 1, just like LSD, heroin. It may have other beneficial effects. I give you that. But it also have too many side effects, too many effects for me to want to use it. CBD, it might be the wonder diet supplement in the future. We don't know. Question mark everywhere. We don't know where it works, what, how it does. Does it have all these other claims? Anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, does it have neuroprotective? You know, if you have brain injury, does it help you? It may. But 
Who is controlling what type of CPD you're using? Does it have no THC at all? Does it have one-to-one -one THC in it? I don't know. There's thousands of preparation out there. If you buy CBD, do you know where it's coming from? Who has it? Some of these, there are, last month, they were shown that some of this preparation has a lot of pesticide, herbicide in it, because during the process of trying to concentrate these chemical, they use plants that has been treated with herbicide, and now the herbicide is concentrating in these medication. Who is out there to control those? Nobody. Not FDA approved. It's considered illegal at the federal level. State do not control medication. If food and drugs is controlled at the federal level, state can legalize things. They don't regulate things. So you're on your own. Buyer beware. CPD, wonder drugs of the future, big question mark. Use it on your, at your own risk. The biggest risk is probably your wallet. If it doesn't work, may not harm you so badly, but it is expensive. So if you have a lot of money to throw away, you want to experiment, let me know. If it works for you, I'll be interested to find out. But I do not think that the verdict is out there to support usage of it at this point. But if you have a medical condition that you desperately need something different than what current treatment is, and there are people out there that say, it works for me, and you want to try, I'm not going to fault you for trying something, but I'm not going to condone you from doing it either. Okay? Question. Do we have a microphone? Just before, just before um, uh, we're going to have a draw for books, and if you have that paper, if you want to be just filling that paper out, we're going to have a draw for a number of different books. So if you like that. Uh, does anyone need a pen? They don't have a pen. They need to... Uh, uh, Luann needs Luan a pen. Luann wants a pen. I, I need a paper. Paper and pen. Okay. Uh, Maria? Luann needs a paper. Okay. If we don't have a mic, I'll try to repeat a question. Mm -hmm. Question? Bus? Okay, that's a good question. What is the relationship between marijuana usage and glaucoma? It short-term reduction in the pressure of the uh, eye. Nine, 2016, there's a conference of all the researcher comes together. They came out and said, marijuana is not that useful for glaucoma, you know, for treatment of glaucoma. The evidence is weak that it does, so they do not. And that's why it has not been approved by FDA. There are people who use it and say they do good, but people who use it, that doesn't have any effect at all, too. So again, got the money? <laughs> CBD and chronic pain. Again, like I mentioned, there are people who use it and it works. There are people who use it, it works for a short time, and you're back to the same where you used to be. There are people that use it and it doesn't work. I don't know where or why it would work because we don't know the mechanism of it. But there are reported people that said that it works wonders. And the people that use it and it doesn't help. I know that if you are addicted to opioid and you are taking opioid and now opioid is being controlled very strictly in Florida. As a physician myself, I can only prescribe three days worth of opioid for someone who has a post-operative pain. I cannot do more than that, even if you have pain. I may be able to go up to seven days if I put an exception saying, oh, this is a very, very painful procedure. After seven days, I can't prescribe anymore. So a lot of people who are hooked on opioids chronically are looking for other ways because they're not getting their op op opioids anymore. 
And that's because we got overdose. Quite the answer is individual. There are reported cases. There are reports that works and then not, that doesn't work. We don't know for sure. The one thing that I can tell you is that U.S. as a country is the only major country that prescribes opioid freely. In Europe, you have surgery, you get Tylenol, you get NSAID, you don't get narcotics. Only the U.S. Question. Back there. We've been fighting post-herpetic neuralgia for more than 10 years. Cannot find anything that will help that. Any suggestions? I'm sure you have tried all the neuromodulators like Neurontin, Lyrica. You, you can nod your head if you did. Those are all neuromodulator for nerve pain. And those are prescription approved medication. I don't have the answer to that question, and I'm not an expert in that field. This was caused by shingles. Yes. It destroyed the sheath around the thoracic nerve. And yes. And there isn't any way to recover that, is there? Unfortunately, they're not, you're not the only one suffering from that, if that's of any consolation, but that's all I can say is it's very difficult. A lot of neuropathic pain are not being treated. Can you recover? Some of these, I don't know if you could, but I would imagine or at least, and you probably have tried a lot of these B12, a lot of these B vitamins, folate that really helps with nerve regeneration and stuff, see if that will help. But I think uh, that's a very painful condition that there is, it's very difficult to treat and I don't know the answer, sorry. Check my neurologist uh, who is in uh, uh, he says that there is a supplement, a prescription supplement, he told me recently, that can be used for uh, neuropathy. Neuropathy. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it is supplement, I think it's based on the B vitamins oh, it, uh, on a high dose basis. Uh, uh, um, he told me my next visit he would explain to me uh, you know, uh, what it was. Let me know what he prescribed. There are, there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies out there that you can't really pattern vitamins. It's natural occurring. But you can make similar to the vitamin and charge a load boat of money for it. And that's what they're doing. High dose vitamins or vitamin derivatives. Any more and question? If not, I thank you for. Go ahead. I was wondering if if you if you buy the oils from the state. When you say oil, you're talking about CBD, THC oil type THC of a deal. THC with okay. CBD in okay. it. Okay. Uh, in, 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 a, in a vaporizing form, does it hurt your lungs? I would say that is not as bad as if you were smoking the leaf part of it directly, but there are people who vaporize and have some respiratory problems with it. Some people said that it happens only the first few times and then you get used to it like if you were smoking tobacco. For the first time you cough and you're have irritant and then after a while your body gets used to it because it killed the cilia or whatever. I have heard that. But does it cause problems? My answer will be most likely if you were inhaling the chemical what does it do? I don't know. What is, what's a long-term side effect or long-term effect on your lung? I don't know that. 
Are there effects on the emotions or the moods or depression? CBD or THC? Either one or even marijuana use? Yes. And it's all short term and long term both. And it's on that list that I went, I didn't read them all, but it's there. I'd be happy to give you this, that whole PowerPoint if you want to read through it. But yes, THC is psychoactive material. It is known to change your mood. It is known, CBD is a downer type of a deal. It relaxes you, it reduces your uh, anxiousness. So yes, just right there, it, it modulates your mood. The one is an upper, one is a downer kind of a thing. One gives you high, the other one kind of lower you down. It's, you know, a lot of people who, out there, and you probably, I mean, some of you know Tiger Wood, he'll take an upper and then he'll take a downer to counteract it in the same setting. Marijuana is like a perfect medication. They have both in it already. Not advocating you using it, but it has it. Jerry. The people that are using the narcotics and have extreme pain and it's not helping at all and they're addicted and then get more addicted. Is it safer to use the marijuana than the narcotics? You know, if I was in that situation where I'm addicted to opioids, narcotics, and it's really, really causing my mind already affected by it. I'm always sleepy because I'm taking so much, I can't be awake. I think trying CBD-based product without the psychoactive, see if it works, I may say try that. I would not try THC at a high dose. Does it help in a low dose? Maybe, but it is very expensive. Insurance doesn't cover. You have to go see a doctor. Once a doctor see you, I think it's two hundred fifty dollars or whatever. He make a determination. You can use it or you can use it. You get a certificate. I think it's issued by the state. I'm not sure. You take that certificate with a prescription. You go to a dispensary. You pay cash for whatever the doctor say you can have, and then you use it. I don't know the cause of all these things, but it's not cheap. But if you are on narcotics to the point where you can't move because you're so dope out, quote unquote, because you can't even get up because you're taking it for pain and you, when you take it, you're sleeping all the time. I don't think that's healthy either. I think there have, should have to be a better way than that. And in that situation, CBD trial, without, you don't have to go to a doctor for that. You can just order online or whatever. It's illegal to transport across the state, so you can't order from out of state, because it's a f against federal to transport illegal drugs across state line. But there are health food, supposedly health food store, herbal store that will sell you CBD preparation here in the state in Central Florida and probably locally. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a good answer for that, but I would say try CBD, if anything. Any other question? This will be our last question. You can order the hemp oil online I did you can my, yes. yeah my son was in a car accident and he was taking some heavy-duty stuff and he wanted to get off of it and so yeah he was taking oxytoxin yeah well, whatever it was and he wanted to get off of it so I ordered some of it and gave it to him he said it made him awfully tired so it's probably have a lot of THC in it and you can order you, they will mail it. I mean, I was listening to NPR this last week. There's a health food store that have a CBD product, and one of the questions was, have you ever been raided by the DEA agent officers for carrying it? And they say, we have not. 
and they were in Missouri. Missouri is one, I think, one of the states that's legalized for medical use. But they say that they themselves have not been raided and have it taken away from them. But they have heard of other health food stores that have CBD product that a DEA agent has come and raided their off their store and taken all the illegal drugs away. So because some outlet can mail it out across illegally, doesn't I mean nothing stopped them from doing it. Nobody checked what contents is in the mail, um, but you you can do it. It's just illegal. <laughs> I hope I didn't break the law. It was it was only twenty dollars for a, a sixteen ounce. Twenty dollar then. I bet you that same formulation is probably much higher now because people the demand is there and everything is demand and supply. I, I, that same twenty dollars is probably a hundred dollars now potentially. Thank you all for coming. I hope this is informative. I know there's a lot of questions that needs to be answered. There's no good data to answer them. I'm just letting you know this is what I did. I spent hours and hours looking for some of these answers. This is the best I can give you, and I think it's pretty up to date. Thank you. Dr. Chang, I know uh, I've got friends, Canadian uh, physician who, uh, candidates, basically marijuana is legal. Uh, it's getting pretty close if it's not there yet. And, uh, uh, but uh, he was showing what the communication he got from the Canadian Medical Association. And it's just like by every, every issue not proven, cannot advise to say yes to use it here. Every single issue, not proven, not proven, not proven. Like there's no research, there's no data to, for, you know, like science has to go by basically hard data to say, yes, it's a good thing to do. You can't sanction something that has nothing behind it. It's just, a, you know, so it's a, it's a cultural thing. It's a big thing. It's a big movement. But uh, as Dr. Chang has basically expressed, there's not, we don't have the science behind it. So it's hard to support and get behind something that, with no evidence. Does that make sense? You know, so you, you know, it would be, because people that are selling products, have you ever noticed that sometimes people in sales uh, uh, ex exalt, the, uh, exalt the value of their product? And there may not be good hard data behind it. Uh, snake oil, a cannabis oil, I wonder if they're in the same category. I don't know. I, I don't know. But uh, it could bite like an adder. That's what uh, God says about alcohol, which is a type of drug as well. So uh, at any rate, um, I appreciate the message today. And uh, if you have any other questions, Dr. Chang will stand by and he'll be able to talk to you. Um, i sorry about that. Um, pardon? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Trying anyway. Uh, Okay, so we have a few books to give away. I'm going to let you choose which one you want, uh, whoever, when, when we draw them. So we're going to have a little draw. When I said drawing, some people put some, did some, put some nice artwork in here for the draw, so that was really nice of you. Okay, so we're going to ask, does anyone want to 